I know somebody at Apple in California, at Apple you know, company. And he said, Dr. Rose, without your invention, the iPhone would not have the performance it has nowadays. The properties of matter, the properties of materials, which are later on used for technology, they are decided in the microstructure. And in the end, it's the interaction of atoms which, with each other which are responsible for the properties. So when uh, I think our era, the last uh, 20, 30 years, are characterized by going into the small and smallest dimensions uh, in order to tailor materials. The collaboration between Harold Rosa, Maximilian Haidar and Knut Orban started in earnest in the mid-1980s. There was a conference in uh, Austria and uh, Salzburg, which we three, Harald Rose, Knut Urban and myself, attended. And we listened, uh, listened to, to the talks. And there was one presentation by the Max Planck Institute of Stuttgart, um, where they presented a new microscope they are just uh, purchasing and will be, should be installed in the near future, which uh, is 1.2 MeV microscope going down to, with resolution downwards to about one angstrom. And, but of course it's a unique instrument and it's very expensive. And how it always started to complain just with a fraction of the cost of such a microscope, we could start the project to use a modern microscope medium voltage microscope with 200 kilovolt, for example, and to compensate the circulation and to have the, about uh, at least the same resolution with uh, lower energy, which means also able to investigate beam-sensitive materials. Harold Rosa proposed in the late 1980s a novel lens design, the Rose Corrector, also known as the Hexapole Corrector enabling aberration correction in transmission electron microscopy. I knew the principles. I always uh, was good in mathematics, but without having a, a statistical insight, I never could use the mathematics. If you have to understand that that's the problem, and, and then you know how to go on to make approximations so that you get the result to a few percent, not exactly, but that you can show it will work and how the principle is, and then you can do it in this final design. Maximilian Haidar realized Harold Rosa's idea and designed the hexapole corrector. What you see here is just a magnetic hexapole element where the electrons then just to the center, which are passing by here in this hole, passing by, and they are. Uh, reacting due to the hexapole field. And it means that a round electron bundle would be uh, disturbed by a threefold asthmatism. That means we don't have a round bundle anymore. We have then a threefold shape of this electron bundle. And the important point is that one really could see single atoms or interfaces at uh, different devices or different objects. That was really just a breakthrough and that was actually, I would call it revolutionary. Knut Orban, together with Max Heider, implemented the first aberration corrected conventional transmission electron microscope. The magnification which you can get in this way uh, is up to about a million uh, times. Now we have a development towards life science applications of this. That means the most exciting development in the moment is for me that biologists start to uh, use such aberration corrected instruments. Uh, in order to advance resolution in, in molecules. Molecular biology nowadays is close to atomic resolution, not, but not fully. That means you can, in a molecule, which normally has 
Ten thousands of atoms you cannot resolve the critical atom. Andrei Krivanek realized the first quadruple octopole aberration corrected scanning transmission electron microscope with sub Angstrom resolution. Essentially, we want to make every single electron that goes through the microscope produce some useful signal. And we can do that nowadays. And so we want to capture the electron, we want to tag its energy, uh, we want to collect a whole bunch of them, and we want to process the images in innovative ways so you can pick up signals that uh, the raw imaging would not give you. Uh, mathematical processing can find out all kinds of signals. Still, it's important to have good optics. So that's where the correctors come in. Our type of microscope makes a tiny little probe and scans it around on the sample. And the probe itself, where it's focused, is actually like typically half the size of an atom, sometimes even smaller than that. To produce the tiny little probe, we can't use uh, round uh, magnetic lenses because they have unavoidable aberrations. This is something that's been known since 1936. And the solutions were proposed in 1948 by a very smart German professor, Otto Scherzer. That's kind of like one of the fathers of this field. And we simply follow one of his recipes. People had been trying for 50 years before it actually worked. So it got a little bit complicated. Uh, but if you do it right, it can, can be made to work. And that's kind of the, the big advance in microscopy, working aberration correctors. Ladies and gentlemen, for the sub-angstrom resolution imaging and chemical analysis using electron beams, please will you welcome to the stage Harold Rosa, Maximilian Heder, Knut Orban and Andre Krivenek. Wow. Well, congratulations to you Thank all, you. first Thank of you. all. Uh, it is an amazing story, this, because all of you are involved in it, but it starts off with you with an idea that's then realized and developed uh, further by Knut Maximilian and uh, Andre. So I want to start with you, because you... Uh, had already been captivated by a professor who'd introduced you to this mysterious world of uh, the at atomic. And then you went to the US and you were asked to solve a problem about radiation damage in biological samples. And was that the beginning of your quest to reveal atoms in all their glory? No. It, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, everybody that, that I uh, oppose, but it, it, thank you for your introduction. But actually, it was my Professor Scherzer who gave me a thesis work to find means uh, how uh, to uh, compensate for this unavoidable aberration of round lenses. Because his aim was, he wanted to see atoms and uh, and also he, he want to make an as a physicist an analysis and you know he was Scherzer was a student of Sommerfeld and Sommerfeld was one of the most famous theoreticians uh, uh, and uh, I think five of his former students got the Nobel Prize so uh, then uh, Scherzer was a little bit disappointed because um, when he said to Sommerfeld that he wants to find a microscope or some means uh, to see atoms. And then Sommerfeld said, oh, why do you go into this? All you will... What are these atoms all about? You will see, <laughs> what you will see are nice pictures. <laughs> but we are physicists. We want to have... We want to have numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the physics that interested you, not the atoms. <laughs> no, 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 no. And that was the, so Shet uh, even want to go further. He just didn't want to see just atoms. He also want to see what kind of atoms are there. Yeah. And uh, as Andre, uh, 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 nowadays, with, with the energy filters and monoc nowadays we can make spectroscopy with a single atom. Yeah. This, this was uh, 
dream of Scherze, but everybody said you are a dreamer, it can never be realized. <laughs> so the, the, the lesson is, I want to say, is never say never, is there no physical law which pre it doesn't allow us, like, like the second law of thermodynamics, yeah? you cannot build a, a baby to mobile, which, uh, so it means a machine which, which runs forever without putting energy into it. <laughs> So never say never, but then you did actually produce a, a theoretical concept, or you had an idea that... For yeah, a, a different ones. Uh, 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 the one which uh, uh, you showed, mm. that was uh, in my work and my habilitation, but uh, we found out uh, it was too complicated to... Uh, so actually we could show this proof of principle that we could get negative uh, spherical aberration, that they act like glasses. We have you for my poor uh, eye lenses to uh, compensate for the, for the uh, aberrations. But that we were not limited by these aberrations. You, because you, to mechanic, you, you must see, if you want to see atoms, they must be stable, that they, 10 seconds, for, you need for an exposure, then they are not allowed to move uh, by, uh, by, by only perhaps by a fraction of the atomic size, otherwise your, your image is blurred. And, and now, but no, the same is now if, if you would have glass, uh, your glasses, if the, the index of refraction would oscillate, then you also could not see anything. Yeah? It's, it's like you, if you look through a fog. And uh, so, so we were limited at that time, not by uh, the aberrations, but by electric mechanical, uh, electromagnetic and mechanical instabilities during, during the, the exposure time. Yeah? And uh, so that was the reason, I believe, at that time, technology was not yet so advanced uh, that we could uh, get such high, high stable uh, instruments and everything which we need. There were no fast computers. And uh, you see, if, if you, uh, let's say, want to make, take a picture, so and you, you say it takes 10 seconds, and you say, oh, I have, yeah, you go to the microscope, it will be stable for one hour. You say, oh, great, I can do a lot of things. <laughs> But if you need three hours to align and adjust it, you can, it's hopeless. So here's this wonderful idea. Yeah. Max and Knut, take yeah. us on from that, okay. because you have well, then, uh, you, have the, 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 the te you have the technology. Well, yes, I studied physics in Darmstadt, and uh, I had carried out a diploma work, and I joined uh, Harald Rose's group, and this first prototype was just finished, we could show that it, it's actually working in terms of the physics, that we can compensate the aberrations, but what we didn't achieve was the better resolution. Therefore, it was a failing project. And uh, I was, from this project, was convinced it will work because there's no physics behind that it should, doesn't work. It was just the instability of the microscope. And therefore, I always pushed hard to go for a different type of corrector to not to compensate everything, just to concentrate on a spherical aberration. And that was then his idea with his uh, uh, system uh, you just showed in this diagram with a hexable corrector. And this actually then we could transfer, we got funding uh, from the Volkswagen Foundation, and then we could, could start in '92 to run this project, and we uh, well, finalized it then in '97 with a new resolution at 200 kilovolt. And Knut, when do you come into this amazing story? Yeah, uh, I think throughout my, my career, I, I was interested uh, to correlate uh, the properties of, of materials with their structure. And uh, of course, the smallest part of the structure is the atom. And uh, so at the time when we started our project uh, together, uh, the microscope was far from being able to uh, go down to the atomic range. So I 
like to say atomic range, not to see atoms, because everybody who studies physics in the first semester, uh, he learns or she learns that uh, the atomic world is governed uh, by quantum physics. And quantum physics uh, is not what you can easily understand. Uh, that means when you go to the atomic world, you get something like an image, but you are normally not in the position to understand what you see. So what we normally have to do, there is no doubt about this, it's not putting your sample in and then uh, you have a microscope and then you see the atoms. You see a lot of things. You see all types of images. The important point is to understand what you have there. And your brain normally is trained for light, uh, seeing with light. And that means your brain is automatically switching to light physics. So when you see, you, you know, the, the question is, is an atom bright or is it dark? I think nobody can answer that so easily. And uh, so, so the point is, when you, when you have an image, you may see five bright dots. So the question is, are these five atoms? It can be all kinds of things. So to understand these things was a challenge at that time. That means how can we correlate our quantum physical knowledge with these, with these things which you can immediately see. That means when I show you an image, you automatically interpret it as a light image. Yeah, that means when you, when you see it, uh, something dark, you, say, you can say it's a shadow. But in quantum physical dimensions, there is no shadow. <laughs> so the, the question is, what do I see when I have a microscope available which makes uh, the atomic range accessible? Wow. Okay, so <laughs> let's <laughs> just... <laughs> yes, quantum physicists, some... welcome to their world. Yeah. <laughs> But let's just sort of finish this story. So, Andre, you know, you, you come in and put the final piece of the jigsaw. So, uh, our perspective is that with the electron microscope, you can do two different things. You can produce images and you can do analysis. So, we can do spectroscopy in the microscope. And you do that a little bit differently. You produce a fine probe of electrons, as I was saying in the presentation, often smaller than one atom. And when you put that beam on the atom, it responds in all kinds of different ways. And you can tell what the electronic properties are in that environment. You can uh, look at different signals which tell you what is the atomic environment about that one particular atom. Uh, nowadays, you can analyze the vibrations of just one single atom. And that was our main interest. So we pushed towards uh, being able to do better analysis, which uh, implies better spatial resolution, but also better spectroscopic resolution. And then there's a whole world of information that opens up. And uh, you can find out things like how phonons in a solid interact with defects, uh, which is a field that we know very little about right now, and we're opening up those things to experimental investigations. Yeah. So what drives you in all of this? Is it people who come along from other disciplines and say, Andre, we'd really like to know this. How can you make it apparent to us, or how can you help us in our research? What drives what you do? So some of the instruments that we designed, we don't actually know in the beginning what they will be good for, ultimately. So it's a little bit like when Galileo looked at the stars with the first telescope that he made. He had no idea he was going to find the moons of Jupiter and, and the rings of Saturn in better resolution. So we keep on surprising ourselves. So like this idea that we would be able to see the vibrations of single atoms. Ten years ago, I had no idea that the technology that we were developing would actually actually make that possible one of these days. And okay, maybe Harold would have thought about it, analyze the cross sections, <laughs> uh, but it just seemed so far away from where we were at that point. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise. So uh, I think we developed the instruments and then the users uh, open up the applications. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, the uh, idea that we can look at uh, phonons from individual defects in matter, uh, 
that's come along in the last couple of years, and uh, uh, that's being developed at uh, University of California at Irvine. Uh, so different collaborators, they've, so it's kind of like uh, you uh, invent the printing press, and uh, what kind of books come out, that's, uh, that's a shared responsibility later on. <laughs> <laughs> and Harold, do you look at uh, what they've achieved from this original idea, and, and uh, are you yeah. proud of them? Let's put it this way, uh, on the said already, uh, I was convinced that it uh, will have an impact, but I never expected that it will have such an impact. And uh, because you see now, you do, as you say, nano, I always said our, you see, you use your iPhone or your tablet here. Uh, so this is, now the information now is on a nanometer scale. And uh, you see without the, the, the electron microscope, now the, that you can see the atom, uh, you never could, uh, let's say you have to inspect uh, to see how it works, or if you make it, it, the, the structures finer and finer, uh, you have to see the structures in order, if there's some uh, errors or, or, or if, uh, if dysfunction, this is it's all on an atomic scale. And uh, I never expected that technology was able to go down with the structure uh, to, 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 I don't know, which of 10, 10 atoms or 20 atoms, uh, now 10 nanometers, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, uh, let, let's talk about the celebration. Yeah, and, 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 <laughs> and other <laughs> person, another, what I, although I was in Albany for 10 years at New York State Department of Health in electromicroscopy, the application, and uh, they all that they were concerned was radiation damage because they wanted to get the most information with this little damage to the sample. Of yeah, I, I, so that means for a certain dose of electrons, what can I do to get for a certain uh, amount of electrons most information out, out of it? And nowadays, uh, due to the advancement in instrumentation in electron microscope, nowadays life science, molecular biology, goes back to the electron microscope. And it's a Nobel Prize, for, for example, for this structure was, was given five years ago to, um, to Henderson and, and uh, 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 Joachim Frank and uh, uh, yeah, uh, Jacques, Jacques Dubergé. Yeah, just for, they found out methods to, uh, to uh, minimize radiation damage. And now it becomes so important in life science. Yeah. And uh, what you, when you said, I'm so uh, fascinated about neuroscience, to understand how the neurons work on an atomic basis, that would be fascinating. I think Harold <laughs> is saying you've done good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, one part but which was missing is for the three Nobel awardees, uh, they didn't use an aberration corrector in life science. Yeah, they, now now yeah. they are just starting to use them. Wow. Yeah, because they had no money. So <laughs> now we come back to funding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, but I just want to talk about celebration, if that's all right. And I'm looking at you, Max, um, okay. if that's all right. Um, so Vivian and yeah, I... So, we, so we were hearing about this, so that you... Because when you started this, you didn't actually think that it would work, and it took you ages and ages and ages to make it work. And your wife was telling us that you came home one morning <laughs> at four in the morning. Uh, Tell well, us about that. That was a project that was funded, and each funding is just limited in time and money. And the time was running out, was end of uh, or summer of 97, and we worked very hard. And at a certain night, I worked during the whole night with Stefan Uhlmann, who just also was a member of my group. And we finally got the ultimate resolution. We could show that we can improve the resolution from 2.4 angstrom to 1.2 angstrom. And that was at 4 a.m. or 4.30 in the morning. And then I came home. My wife didn't know where I am. She knew 
that I met at work at the lab, <laughs> but she waited for me, and then when he came home, she started to shout with me. And I so told she her, was giving you an earful wait, because wait, you were I late home. I would like home. to open a bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you so much for sharing the story, and it is such a lovely story to be able to be told by, by all four of you. Please do uh, congratulate our uh, 2020 nanoscience to Harold, Max, Knut and Andre. Congratulations. Thank you.